Um, so I'm going to talk about politeness, convention, and ritual, which is a key thing in our in our project, and it's one of the key things in in certain politeness research as well. Yesterday I was talking about aggression, how to disentangle aggressive and non-aggressive behavior, and we agreed that you know threat and aggression, aggressive threat is basically a ritual. This is why it's so frightening. But apart from threat, this convention of ritual is a broader category. So in order for us to conduct this project, I thought it might be useful if I overview this theme, partly because it will uh, help me to, to show you roughly what people do in survey politeness research. So again, we work towards a broader macro model politeness and impoliteness. In order to create such a macro model, we need to study interactional recurrence, so the reoccurrence of things, plus tendencies of behavior, so social practices, in order to find something which is culture specific and in a sense quantifiable. One thing which worries me and others well is about the second wave idiosyncratic stuff is that they talk about or make claims that you can never quantify uh, politeness and impoliteness. It makes me very because if you can't quantify things, then you can't do this research. And obviously, in, in our project, for example, we do have to quantify things. Um, it is already doing this. You were talking about various traits, right? It is important. I do believe that it's important. You can't do uh, serious politeness research without quantitative evidence. Although I believe that politeness research is basically a qualitative field. It's definitely qualitative. You need to dig into details, but you can't completely ignore numbers, figures. They are just there. In order to capture these numbers and figures, the best way to, or the best area to study is convention and ritual. Now, not every, uh, sorry, not every recurrent form of behavior is conventional and ritual. There are many recurrent forms of behavior, many social practices. But when it comes to politeness and impoliteness in particular, then the, the important recurrent behaviors are conventions and rituals. So, well, conventions and rituals are used quite broadly, especially convention. So I have a colleague and friend, she's on this stream, Marina Terporavi, basically pointed out that convention is something very important. Uh, people used to talk about convention in pictures, looking to grab them. So the notion of convention is there. Uh, and also ritual, well, it's not as popular as convention, but it also emerges occasionally in politeness research. The problem is that people have not really distinguished these notions. So often convention and ritual are used in vague and kind of interchangeable ways. And in order to sort of dig into this phenomena, we need to specify what we mean by convention and ritual and how these concepts are related to politeness and impoliteness. As Ritesh has kind of noted in the few past few years of my life, since roughly from 2009, I have been involved in ritual research. This is something very rich and I I think I'm going to continue it forever, basically. That was my first book on, on, on ritual, published by Margaret Macmillan in 13, Relation of Rituals and Communication. Ritual is cool, so if any of you is interested in this phenomenon, uh, I would be more than happy to discuss uh, possible collaborations. And in a sense, in our project, we are focusing on, on the rights, the rituals of strength, not at all forms of, of an aggressive behavior. Okay, so there are utterances. Like, would it make sense to discuss this in private? May I come on board? And also, for example, do you have a light, mate? Midnight, cash machine. These are all utterances which are not ad hoc. What are these utterances? That's the question. How are they related with politeness and impoliteness? And is this relationship a constant one? And the answer to these questions is that, well, if you do convention and ritual research, you will need, be able to say that these, for example, would it make sense to discuss this in private? It's a typical indirect, conventional indirect question. Welcome on board. It's a 
if you go ritual for form of behavior, or do you have light makes a typical ritual for form of behavior? We would like to think that we are ingenious when we use language, but in many cases these, these utterances pre-exist. So we use them in a recurrent way in order to say something. Okay, so in order to answer how these, these phenomena operate, we need to do convention and ritual research. I told you that, well, in our project uh, with, with Ritesh Atuna Diogo, we are interested basically in threats and aggression. However, no, because we, came, we have come from the field of politeness and impoliteness, this research cannot be completely separated from politeness and impoliteness. And for example, in order to understand how convention and ritual operate, it's worth talking about the concept of time, which Michael and myself picked up in a 2013 book. Some forms of interaction take place in the here and now. So if you say something to someone who you don't know, and you say something sudden, unusual, then, then for example, you, there is a guy who wants to date with a, with, a, with a lady. He goes to her, say that, gosh, look, 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 I have some. Would you like to have a date with me? Of course, it's not a threatening, hopefully it's not a threatening setting. But it happens then and then. They have no trajectories, no previous interaction history, nothing. So this might be a compliment in the here and now. However, some occasionally here and now is emergent. So we often talk to people who we know already. Like, I talk to my Indian colleagues here, who I know from previous, but here it is, I know from various conferences. When we start to talk, we have joint trajectories. We have joint interactional histories. So we don't start everything from scratch. So the interaction is going to be emergent. And finally, there are interactions with when we, which are recurrent, when we animate the there and then in the here and now. Like, do you have a light mate? We all know that this is threatening if it's said in the incorrect time and place, because we all know that this is an utterance used by bullies, right? So this is why it is something which pre-exists, enacted in the here and now, and in our project, we are interested in this kind of time, sense of time, in order to quantify, to be able to say general things about about our data, we need to capture recurrent elements of, of language use. Does this make sense? Are you still with me? But again, these recurrent elements of language use are convention and ritual when it comes to the realm of politeness and impoliteness. Now, what is the difference between convention and ritual? It's quite a difficult thing. I told you that these two phenomena are often used in an interchangeable way. And Marina Terkorafi and myself have just written an article in which we try to sort of set the differences between these phenomena. Basically, these phenomena are different in terms of audience. So a convention is primarily carried out for the benefit of the interactants by the reason the actor, the very basic basic reason for ritual is to be carried out in front of an audience other than the interactants themselves. So when something is ritual, it is kind of public. There is a potential audience. We were talking about this case of uh, the rape, and there are a couple of guys going to a lady in a bus at midnight, said, oh, of course you're beautiful. Make, they make these very unnice it's very li uh, likely that sort of they are, they not only do this bad thing, but also there is an audience behind their behavior. It's themselves, right? It's an audience. So it's a kind of performance. They know, everybody understands that this is a performance of bullying, an evil performance. But it's definitely a performance that everybody knows, sees that this is a performance. This is why we understand that this is a threat. If it wasn't a performance, the performance of bullying, it was, would not be self-evident that this is a threat. But we do understand that this is a threat because it's a performance. For convention, it's not necessarily that it, that it means that it's not a performance, really. It's just a kind of intrinsic part of language use, like if I make an indirect request, conventional one, 
would it make sense to discuss this? You wouldn't be like, oh, it's a performance for somebody else. It's just an intrinsic part of our, moment, or our conversation. So you see that these are very different phenomena, actually. Also, salient. Conventions tend to be salient or marked only for those who are outside the group or culture in which the convention operates. Ritual, on the other hand, are salient primarily to those who perform them or take part in them as an audience. So again, if I make an indirect request in Britain, would it make sense to develop? It just goes unnoticed. But threat, which is typically a ritual form of behavior, it's absolutely noticed. Everybody is on alert, right? It's on alert. It's a performance which creates uh, alert. It, it is salient for those who perform it as well. So for example, in the case of this kind of raping compliment, the victim will absolutely know what is going on and will be terrified. It's salient. It's not just something which will pass unnoticed. Time and place. Conventions are are only loosely constrained by context. So I could ask this indirect question from anyone at any time. But rituals can only take place at certain times and places like threats, right? I told you yesterday that if we go further this year, beyond this year, and we create a machine, a software which is operationalized at ATM machines, I, I was using this word hotspots for crime, right? Because threat is not something which takes place all the time or even anywhere. A ritual threat will take place in specific unusual times and places. This is why, you know, they will become threats. And finally, ratification. Everybody can say a perform a ritual, a convention. So it doesn't matter who I am. Uh, I can make indirect requests, for example. But in order to make a ritual, it has to be. I have to be a bully, or I have to have a role. If, for example, to threaten someone, I mean, I'm Daniel Kadar, an academic, and I think I'm a nice guy. I wouldn't threaten others. I can't, I'm not ratified. I can't perform this particular role. There are roles in certain social practices. So, for example, in the case of rape, again, which you want to prevent, it's usually something that takes place between the guy who acts in the role of bully and the victim. If somebody wants to intervene, and I'm going to talk about intervention tomorrow, then often the wrongdoer says that no, you are not, not you should just, it's not your business, right? Because it's a ritual between the two of us. It's interesting, isn't it? So this is why what I'm talking about, I believe it's extremely important from the perspective of our project. Now, uh, convention and ritual are often con constructed in conversation. Because we shouldn't forget that we are, we are interaction experts. So it's very difficult to, to predict what is a convention and ritual. Well, it's possible. But there might be interpretational debates about what's a ritual and convention. For example, singing a national anthem. It's, if you take it seriously, it's definitely a ritual for you. You take it seriously. Some people don't really take care about national anthems. And for them, it's more like a convention, a meaningless kind of. Act. But I think that in most of the time, that such a singing like a national theme is still a ritual because it takes place in a specific setting, is in a specific in front of a specific audience, uh, it occurs in a specific time and place as a performance. Okay. I stop for a moment. Any question? Yes, my, I, I hope my. It, it, I'm sure that it, it, it makes sense for my colleagues because, uh, I mean, this is, this is what uh, basically a framework in our project to some extent. So this is why I'm eager to, to hop on this train and sort of get to get into this. Oh, you, you have to Oh, okay, sure. Okay, then, then I go, f I, I try to finish uh, in 20 minutes and then we will have some time for Q&A. Having, I, so far I was focusing on differences between convention and ritual. It's worth noting though that they have many common characteristics as well. And this is why it's worth talking about them together. And this is what many people in the third wave theory do. Like most of them are recurrent social practices. 
Both of them are normative, so they count as something I should do for those who are involved. Like, for example, a right of abuse, a ritual of abuse, which are interested to study. It's, if you're a bully, it's pretty normative for you to do this. And it's like, I always did this. I always abused women. I always, it's my custom. And it's saying, if you are these guys, they will regard their practices as normative. Although from our perspective, of course, as crime preventers, it's everything but not normative. But from the perspective of, of the interaction itself, for the ritual performer, and from the ritual performer's perspective, such practices are definitely normative. And finally, formal, these practices are formal and sequential. Like, if you perform a ritual, it's not an ad hoc form of behavior. Like, we were talking about harassing a female on a bus. It always has some similar formal elements, like, hey, you are nice, typical form, nice. Hey, you are beautiful body, blah, 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 hey, sweetheart. It also has its own sequentiality. First response says a compliment. So they don't it yesterday, then the, the woman remains in silence. Then the other says, why don't you speak? You're beautiful. Again, silence. So it, it operates in a sequential way, which presets sequential characteristics. And this is quite important for us, again, in the project, because we need to look in the long term on, on, on the notion of forms and sequential characteristics as well. Now, I'd say a few words about convention and then about ritual. Uh, convention is less, less, uh, less interesting from the perspective of our project, but it's worth sort of overviewing this question. Well, a typical conventional implication is if you make a sentence or utterance like, it's so hot in here. It's a, it's a typical conventional request to please open the window. It's in all the pragmatics textbooks. It's really like, open a couple of, of, of pragmatics textbooks and it's all hot in here. It's so hot in here seems to be there. Now, in terms of conventionalization, in European philosophy, so Platonian, Plato's philosophy, it can be argued that in a sense all language is conventional. So the meanings of linguistic expressions cannot be universal, but rather attached to a particular group or a particular time and place. And according to Marina Tercorafi, this is a big sense of convention. So for example, if we decide that a dog is dog, we use the word dog for that animal which has four feet and which barks, then this is a convention, really. Why do you use this word? It's a conventional thing. However, there is an alternative understanding of conventionalization, conventions, which is more like the strong sense of convention, and which we more often use in pragmatics, basically the conventional implicature in a Gricean sense. So basically, so you as a speaker, you have an intention, and you can take it for granted that people will be recognized what you intend to say because it's conventional as an implication. It's first noting that convention can mean many things. We in pragmatics are interested in this stronger sense of convention. Now, in convention research, there was a person called David Lewis who emphasized how conventions can emerge out of rational calculations of payoffs, bringing them closer to the deliberative end of language use. So basically, David Lewis argued that, that there is a lot of rationality behind using convention. It's a kind of means and things like in Brown and Levinson's case. For example, it will, it will cause, it will, it will be a win-win situation if you use conventions and you speculate about this. Not surprisingly, Lewis's definition has been broadly criticized and my colleague Marina Tercorafi made an alternative proposal about this phenomenon of conventionalization. She argued that conventionalization can be the optimal solution to the dual problem of constructing identity and constituting face at one time and at the same time. The normativity of conventions becomes the reason the être of conventions themselves. Behaving as others do is not only a way of securing their positive judgment, but also of being seen to be one of them. So the basic idea is that you may not even speculate about following conventions. You simply perform these because you want to be part of a society, want to be accepted. Like when, I, when I'm in England, in Hungarian culture, asking indirect questions is not very popular. Would it make sense? Uh, I would never ask this question in Hungarian. I would say just let's go.
something like that. That would, that would make sense to go to the party of some walk. It's very indirect. But I may follow this practice when I'm in England because I want to fit in. Right? So it's so easy why we use conventions. Uh, typical conventions. How do you mate and you? Right? And then conventions operate with clear moral orders. We were talking about it in the previous previous lessons. I told you that as far as the moral order of conventional practices is not upset, then everything seems to be unnoticed. They flow on, the conversation flows on. Please step outside. Oh, sorry. No, no, it's not possible. This is Richard now. Darcy, do you have any idea what century we actually live in? Are you going to step outside or am I going to have to drag you? I'm going to have to drag me. Okay, so this is a typical ritual. So conventions and rituals are very different from each other. And in our project again, we are interested in ritual which online convention never gets unnoticed. It was a threat for you. Have you seen this film, by the way? Do you know which film it is from? Bridget Jones, right? It's very popular in the West. Basically, in this film, there's a girl, Bridget Jones, and there are two guys uh, both want to make her their girlfriend, so they're in a competition. Now, Bridget Jones goes to Thailand, meets one of the guys. She ends up in a prison because somebody puts a drug in her suitcase. And the, uh, and the guy just disappears, just leaves her there. And then the other guy saves, saves her and goes back. Now, when the guy goes back to England, he meets the other, the, the other guy who left Bridget in Thailand in a complete, complete mess. And then he basically threatens him in a very polite and gentle way. Would you mind stepping outside, please? It's a typical nightly challenge. It shows to the English speaker that there is going to be a bloody fight. So it's about it's the beginning of a fight, it's ritual. The joke, the humor here is that the other says that, that no, no, thank you. <laughs> well, I have to take your chicken's answer. And then Mark Darcy, the guy says, so look, do I have to, do you, do you come yourself or do I have to drag you out? And the other guy says, I'm afraid you have to drag me out. And he drags him out and the fight starts. This is ritual behavior, aggressive behavior. It's very salient. It doesn't, it's not, it's never remain unnoticed. So I think you can see the difference, right? It's a performance again. When you, for example, challenge the other, hey, come outside. It's a ritual of, you know, we are going to a fight. It's a ritual of challenge. Everybody notices that you play a role here. It can't be unnoticed because that you know that there will be a fight after. So everybody was on, on the alert, like, oh, okay, these guys are going to hit each other strongly. How can it be unnoticed? It can't. But again, it's recurrent. It's not just produced by the speakers, but it's something which makes sense for everyone. It's a performance with recurrent elements. So, Rachel. <clears throat> so, well, uh, in, in terms of politeness and impoliteness, Rachel have the characteristics of performance, which I discussed to some extent, recurrence and justification. Performance means that when you perform a ritual, you put yourself into a role. It's like acting in a role. It's not necessarily yourself, but rather you fulfill a role and use politeness, impoliteness, or forms of threat in, in a pre-prescribed way. Like here, Mark Darcy puts himself into the role of a knight, right? sort of somebody, a gentleman, who stands up for his lady. The wrongdoer who wants to rape a victim will put himself into the role of the raper, right, or rapist, sorry. So this is what I mean by performance. Also recurrence, this kind of phenomena operate with very clear recurrent elements. And finally, well, I mean recurrence is something interesting. Like for example, you can recurrently do not do something. Say that there is a there is an office party or several office parties and you want to bully one of your colleagues and you recurrently not invite this person. You can refer to things that, oh, I just forgot it. But it's not significant again and again. It's very obvious that, you know, it's made with some intentionality. 
the justification, yeah, justification means that in order to, I mean, if you perform a ritual, it's not everybody who can do this ritual. Say these two guys started to fight here, right? Can anyone else join the fight? No, it's their own business. Although some may want to intervene. I'm going to talk about intervention tomorrow. Crime prevention is a form of intervention. However, it's their business, basically. So it takes place between them. This is the case with many crime cases as well, which we study in our projects. Well, in terms of well, post convention ritual have, have in politeness and impoliteness implications. It's simply because, and again, I told you that, that here, we are not say, talking about just politeness and impoliteness, in particular our project, but politeness and impoliteness lingers behind any kind of inquiry with you. But when it comes to conventional practices, there is a sense of directness, indirectness, all kinds of things which the Brown and Levin Sylvia literature describes quite neatly. So I think this, this part of the of, 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 of this uh, Brand and Levin Sonia literature is reliable in terms of conventional behavior, provided that you don't make universalist claims. Again, let me revisit this point. There is the culture variation factor as well. So what counts more or less polite in terms of specific conventional behavior depends on culture conventions. In terms of ritual, well, um, because ritual is a performance, this is something from my book, but let's not analyze this. This is a bit way too complex, and instead of studying this, we should study British data, so proper extracts. But basically, in terms of ritual, anything can have a ritual implication. So for example, in, 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 in rituals of friendship, it's often the case that people use expertise like, hey, motherfucker, in a ritual way. It's not impolite because it's ritual. It's, it's, it's ritualized in a specific way, right? And this is why ritual is something we're studying. It's not bound to forms, but rather forms are bound to ritual practices. So it works the other way around. This is why we can't just conduct a study of forms, but instead we need to look into recurrent social practices, in particular ritual in, in our project. Yeah, okay, I think this is it. So those colleagues who have to go can go now. I still keep the others for a short conversation. Um, well, I, I was talking yesterday about this model of aggression, right? This is the important stuff, so let's keep this in mind, the aggression stuff. We can't get rid of the notion of ritual, and again, politeness and impoliteness are there. So though I told you that we are not doing politeness research proper in the, work, in the, in the project, ideas of politeness is there, like for example, you can sort of mask, you can incorporate your ritual practice, like a ritual abuse, in a polite cloak, where you can make your abuse more threatening, even more threatening, by adding impoliteness to it, right? And politeness and impoliteness will also be there in the interpretation of the ritual practice. So don't get me wrong again, politeness and impoliteness are important, but in order for us to study threats and prevent crime, we need to study a specific aspect of politeness and impoliteness, this kind of recurrent social practice of ritual which is quantifiable, which can be generalized but not necessarily overgeneralized. So that is good news for us because it means that we have something in hand. So we don't need to worry too much about idiosyncratic forms of behavior. Cool, this is it really. Question. Certain non-linguistic forms, such as you know, a softness of voice, which is often related to, let's say, politeness, and the loud loudness or harshness of sound, which is related to uh, rudeness, are they conventionalized or ritualized? And you know, 
in certain situations i don't think because people are impolite even when they are you know speaking in a you know low voice or when they are speaking softly so how do you kind of you know it's very good point very very good point the thing is um yes they can be conventionalized and ritualized the problem is that it's very difficult to predict just a relationship between politeness and soft voice, for example. There are very evil guys who speak like this, and they can be very evil, right? Yeah, many, many evil people. For example, my example of the rapist. You say, oh, you look great, and it's extremely threatening from the victim's perspective. So it's very, uh, well, yeah. Um, so instead of making general comments, I think what we need to do is empirical research, to so do an awful lot of prosody research, like in the case of crime prevention. Prosody is extremely important, and we need to capture the relationship between prosody and certain forms of abusive behavior, threatening behavior. I, I, I do think that there is a straightforward link, there must be one. So, for example, I think when, it, when a crime happens, and it's, an, it's a kind of covert crime, so it doesn't start immediately like, hey, do you have light? It's very unlikely that somebody will speak in a harsh voice. But it might be, might, there might be differences. So what we need to look, do is to look into tendencies and recurrences. But in general, yes, it's, it, absolutely everything is conventionalized and ritualized. I mean, on the level of convention, there are culture conventions. Are you supposed to talk silently or loudly, for example? In India, I love this. And people speak loudly, just like Hungarians. I go outside, I really enjoy, like, I went out with a taxi and somebody, I, I bargained in a shop. And the guy said, no, 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 no it's too like, expensive, or too, too, too cheap, you need to give me more money. I was even more loud, saying that, no, 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 you know. We went on like this. In this sense, this kind of convention of of negotiating is something which I think both Indian culture and Hungarian culture is supposed to be loud, right? But here I try to speak, but it's conventionalized again in a relatively small voice in order to avoid you thinking that I'm an idiot, right? So it depends on what, on the purpose of the of, of of the conventional or ritualistic practice. Does this answer? I mean, uh, I, I, there is no magical recipe for. Uh, recipe for, for defining which kind of prosody or tone of voice is associated with what kind of behavior. It's more like something that you need to do in practice. So this is what I emphasize to my colleagues, that to empirical, empirical, empirical. We need to do data, 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 and search.